Well, good morning. Good to see all you folks. Good to hear the chatter. Part of coming to the Lord's house is to uh, talk to others, encourage each other, and see how things are going. Uh, this morning we're going to sing the first song is Grave into Gardens. And the verse that we saw this morning in Sunday school is 2 Corinthians 5.17. I hope we got the right run, 5.17. But we are risen with Christ. No more... That old nature is to control us, but sometimes we do let that old nature control us. But um, as we as we live for the Lord and allow Him to live through us, and Him give us the strength, all those things that we try to seek for, and I just kind of fall away, Lord willing, fall away, and to live for Christ. So the song we're going to sing is, you know, we search the world, trying to find happiness, trying to find satisfaction, but we know. It's only in the Lord. If you know the Lord today, you can really rely on that. So let's stand together as we sing Graves into Garden. Hey, Dave, could we have a monitor here? The uh, right.
Thank you, God, that we have a wonderful and mighty God that we serve. And Lord, I just pray that if there's one here this morning that does not know you as their Savior, Jesus, I just pray that through the songs that are uh, sung or through the uh, message that is spoken, whatever, Lord, I just pray that, that no one leaves here, Lord, without having you in their life. Lord, thank you so much for all that you do for us. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. And before you are seated, if you'll welcome one another, shake a hand, salute, wave, whatever you feel comfortable doing. Good morning, good morning, and welcome. Welcome to Jasper Bible Church, and we are so glad that you're here. Those who are joining us live stream, those in the chapel, we welcome you. 
and if you are seated in the center aisle right by there you will see a black book. It is called the Ministry of Friendship book and if you are visiting with us we are so glad that you are and if you will sign the Ministry of Friendship book along with everyone else and that will give us record of your attendance with us and then if you will pass that book down and then once it's gone all the way down have it opened up send it back the other direction and it will help you to get better acquainted with those who are seated in your row. What is going on this week? Well, tonight at 6 o'clock, we conclude our study in the New Testament book of Titus, looking at the subject, Living for Jesus, Titus chapter 3. Church board meeting at 7 o'clock this evening. And then uh, this Wednesday night, there is something for everybody, uh, first through sixth graders, the seventh through twelfth graders, the adults in the sanctuary here. Uh, you'll notice the 23rd Psalm will be a week from this Wednesday where we uh, continue that. And that subject will be Sleepless in Jasper, not Seattle but Jasper, and we'll be seeing what the Bible says about that. Also, next Sunday morning, after the morning service, uh, probably in the chapel, we'll be meeting with those who will be helping with the Scripture Memory Program. And you might say, well, what Scripture Memory Program? What we're going to do is starting in the month of September for the first through sixth graders, their class will start at 645, and it will go until 730, but from 730 to 8, then there will be a scripture memory program that takes place. Uh, if you are first through sixth grade and have not gotten your scripture memory sheet, if you will do that. If you are willing adults to help out in simply listening to the verses, and we can explain all that's going on, let us know that, be at that meeting next week, and if you can't be at that meeting, let us know that, and uh, I'll write your name down and make sure that uh, uh, Royce and Don Olinger and Sue Bill have that information. Otherwise, uh, but that will be the first Wednesday in September when that starts. Uh, to, speaking about starting up, not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, Grief Share begins. So let me know, or Lucy Ames know, if you are interested in that. Two Sundays from now, after the morning service, we have our church picnic. And you can feel free to uh, uh, come dressed accordingly. Uh, if you are from the great state of Ohio or south of here and you don't want to go all the way back home to get the dish to pass, uh, you can even bring it here and put it in the fridge or whatever, and, or you can put it in my office. I'll taste test it and then put it in the fridge. But. Um, <laughs> You can have that there, and we have uh, Christian Family Center is where that's going to be at. So you'll notice the information. There's a Frisbee golf tournament. Uh, there is um, uh, probably going to be cornhole, uh, a volleyball, and all kinds of things. And then for the teens afterwards, your day's just begun, you'll go from there to uh, the Voorhees house where you'll be having swimming and games that will be there. No evening service that night, just to let you know. And otherwise, I think everything else in the bulletin is pretty much self-explanatory. But I do have several prayer requests to get you updated on. Uh, you heard uh, last Sunday that Harold Kunkel passed away. Uh, the service for Harold is going to be this Friday at 6 o'clock p.m. in the sanctuary here, and then we'll go to the fellowship hall for the lunch following. And so just to let you know about that, also different ones that are recuperating or are in the hospital, continue to be praying, if you will, for Corey Elcock, who is now at St. Joseph Hospital in Ann Arbor. Continue to be praying for Brenda Scher. Uh, as far as I know, she's still at Regency, but they were looking at maybe going to a Flower Hospital area. Skyla Duff recuperating from her surgery that she had on Friday. Be praying, if you will, for her as she recuperates. Irene Kalmbach is back with us and doing well. Barb Shook, probably later this month, will be having a back surgery, if I recall. Marjorie Van Valkenburg is uh, uh, at home. Uh, there is hospice care for her in regard to her uh, heart ailment that she has. Also, Blaine Roberts. Uh, many of you recall Blaine and Mary Jane Roberts. Blaine is at the hospice house uh, now. Be praying, if you will, for, uh, for him. Also, Ruth Richardson uh, is right now at Kingston, but it sounds like in the next day or so is going to be going to an assisted living location in Toledo. Her daughter is from that area. So be praying, if you will, for Ruth and that transition for her. 
Our son-in-law, Glenn Thompson, has uh, the next couple of weeks, I think, four different appointments that are important ones for uh, timing on that, so uh, uh, for getting back to work and all that goes along with that. So remember that, if you will, in your prayers. So many others that were mentioned during our Sunday school hour, and so you can be thinking of those and praying for those as we have our prayer time. I believe Angie has the special music, so she can be getting ready for that. This time, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for each one that's here today, that we can approach you in prayer with these different requests. I thank you that Harold had received Jesus as his Savior, that even as uh, we honor his life on Friday, that we know he's already with you. And we just thank you for that promise from God's Word. I pray for Corey, pray for uh, Bill Justice, for uh, Brenda Scher, for uh, Skyla Duff. Uh, Barb Shook, Marjorie Van Valkenburg, uh, Blaine Roberts, and each of these with various health needs. I just pray that you would uh, encourage them. Thank you that Irene can be back with us. I think also of Glenn, that he'd have good reports here coming up with these different doctor visits for Ruth and this transition time for her. I just pray that things will go well for her. I uh, think of uh, Louise and this uh, doctor appointment tomorrow, that that will go very well also. And, and uh, I pray too for... Um, uh, Pat Reno and, and uh, uh, Richard Refner and Patrick Frederick, Maxine Smith and Alan Shook and Kelly C. And, and we think of so many that are dealing with cancer. I just pray that you would encourage them and, and meet each need and give wisdom and guidance as far as uh, uh, the treatment for that. I pray for our country that you would give wisdom and guidance to those that govern over us, that they would look to you in your word. And I think of those who arrived here today with a burden upon their heart. Their name may not be on the list or are not just spoken of, but you know exactly what they're experiencing. And I just pray that through singing praises to you through the message from God's word today, that you would use it to convict, challenge, and encourage each one. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
One of my favorite poets, thank you by the way, Angie, for the special music this morning. One of my favorite poets is a guy by the name of B.L. Jewett. And um, <laughs> in fact, he likes to rhyme all the time. And that's no crime. But anyway, there's a passage from the Bible I'd like to share with you in Matthew 7. It says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter into it. Verse 14, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And based on that passage was a poem that you'll notice in the bulletin. It says, the fork in the road, and it says this, I have a choice that I must make. Two roads are seen, but one to take. One road is wide and looks so fair, and many of my friends walk there. But though at first the road looks swell, it enters in the gates of hell. The other road has room to spare, and challenges are always there. But on this road I have a guide who lets me walk right by his side. He even takes me round the bend when this life's road comes to an end. The dwelling there gives joy and peace, a lasting stroll they'll never cease. This second road's the one I'll take, but what's the choice that you will make? And that's the question I have for you, is what's the choice that you will make? You see, here's the truth, and don't you want to hear the truth, right? Not everyone wants to hear the truth. The truth is everyone is going to spend forever, either in heaven or hell. And there's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus and his death on the cross as payment for our sins. Every other road, it's wide, it leads to destruction. Say, well, how do you get to heaven? Well, first of all, you need to admit that you're a sinner. The Bible says we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you think you're perfect, just ask the person next to you. They'll straighten you out on that. We've all sinned. But Jesus never sinned. He walked on this earth and accomplished what he came to do. He died on the cross for you. He died on the cross for me. And when Jesus was dying on the cross... He was placing upon himself the punishment that we deserve for the bad things we've done. He didn't stay dead, but he came back to life again. And he offers one way to heaven. And it's not through being baptized. It's not through being a member of a church. It's not through thinking you've done more good than bad. It's not through your work. It's through the work that he has done. It's through receiving Jesus and his death on the cross as payment for your sins. So the question is simple. Is that the choice that you've made? Have you intentionally said yes to that free gift that he's offering to you? You see, the gift's not yours until you receive it. If someone goes to offer you a gift and you say, no, thank you. Or you say, well, let me think about it and I'll get back with you. That, that gift's not yours until you receive it. You have an opportunity right now to receive the greatest gift ever, the forgiveness of sins, eternal life in heaven, based on God's word. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. If you'll bow your heads, please. I know there are many of you who have received Jesus as Savior. This is not some magical prayer. It's not something you have to recite every day or week. It's a one-time decision to simply receive Jesus as Savior and he knows the sincerity of your heart. And right where you're seated right now, if you'd like to make that decision, you can simply follow along with me in this prayer. Heavenly Father, I admit that I have sinned, but I want to go to heaven when I die. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, that he came back to life again. So I receive Jesus as my Savior. I invite him into my life to forgive my sins 
so I can go to heaven one day. And Lord, you know the hearts of every single person here. And you know those who prayed that prayer with me. And you know the sincerity of their heart. Please give them the courage to share that with us after the service today so we can rejoice with them. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before we have our main message, which we are continuing in the book of Philippians, we are going to sing, I'll Fly Away. And maybe after you've uh, heard the message, you will, will wish you would have. But anyway, we're going to be, talks about that day when we're going to be in heaven with our Lord Jesus. Isn't that great? So let's stand as we sing, I'll Fly Away. that that song woke you up, my job is to keep you up. So we are going to look at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. If you're using the Bible right in front of you in the pew, it starts off with page 1671. 1671. If you're in the chapel, it is uh, page 1161. And again in here, 1,671. If you have your own Bible, you're at home in the New Testament, about two-thirds of the way, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. But we are looking at Philippians chapter 1, verses 18 through 21, in a message entitled, Fear Not. Fear Not. You know, there was a teenage girl who was feeling sick. So she grabbed the thermometer from the medicine cabinet, she popped it into her mouth, and her mom screamed, Julie, Julie, that's the dog's thermometer. And Julie spit it out and said, ooh, that was in Fido's mouth? The mom hesitated and said, well, not exactly. <laughs> we live in a scary world, don't we? There's terrorism, there's shootings, there's disease, there's war, there's inflation, and yes, there are unsanitary thermometers. And often 
when we have scary things in our lives, we respond with fear and anxiety. And different people respond differently. There are some when they are afraid, you can visibly see the panic and you can see them trembling. There are others who direct it inwardly. They act like everything is great on the outside, but they're making themselves physically ill on the inside. There are others who get in attack mode, like a cat that's backed up in a corner. And because of our fears, we miss out on both happiness and sleep. Only God knows the minutes and the hours that have been sacrificed on the altar of fear and worry. When you think about the worst thing that could possibly happen to you, what, what, what comes to mind? Is it cancer? Dying? A secret sin exposed? Being lonely and bedridden in a nursing home? Being terminated from your job? Public embarrassment? The death of a loved one? Family feuds? Well, here in this book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul was a candidate for fear. If anyone had the right to be fearful, if there's such a right, it would have been the Apostle Paul. Because in a Roman prison, he experienced the three things that we fear most. First of all, Paul was confronted with the fear of frailty. The fear of frailty. The potential of the loss of control. How many people like to be in control of things? All right, the others of you are lying. That's all right. That's all right. That sermon is next week. But we want to be in control of things, and the Apostle Paul was no different. For Paul, he had countries that he wanted to visit. He wanted to share the gospel with a number of different people. And he was organized. He had a planned schedule. But every once in a while, God would reshuffle the cards. And things didn't always happen just the way that he was expecting it to happen. Paul learned, as we have to learn as well, that the future is not always in our hands. First of all, Paul was aging. Anybody here that's aging that gets a year older every year? You know what I'm talking about. His wavy hair had waved goodbye. For the Apostle Paul, his bulging biceps had lowered to his belly. For Paul, his health was deteriorating. And if, and if you'll notice, according to the book of Acts, on his mission trips, he often had Dr. Luke with him to help him out. Also for Paul, there were new people that were being put in charge of different churches that he had established. Things that had been in his control were slowly becoming more and more out of his control. And then, of course, there was the threat of ongoing physical harm that could happen at him and with him and to him at any moment. For example, at any moment, Paul's last meal might not be one he ate, but it might be one he was. You see, he was one decree away from becoming a dinner guest. A dinner guest to hungry lions in a Roman Colosseum. And yet, for Paul, amazingly, instead of panic, he had peace. Instead of fear, he had cheer. How is that possible? How could Paul be confident that things would turn out okay? Well, the answer is that Paul focused on the future solution 
rather than the present situation. Notice verse 18. Notice what Paul wrote. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Remember, now he's writing this from a prison. And the key word is the word rejoice or joy. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. How did Paul know that things were going to turn out okay for his deliverance? Actually, there's two reasons given here. First of all, he says, through your prayers. Paul knew that there were many people that were praying for him and that God would answer those prayers by Paul being delivered. Secondly, you'll notice it says, in God's provision of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. Paul knew that the Holy Spirit would help him in response to the answer to those prayers. So here's my question. Do you trust God that he is in control? Especially when you feel as though things in your life have gotten out of control. I have a critical question for you. And I don't want you to answer it right away in your mind because I want you to answer it honestly, not just the way that you think you're supposed to answer it at church, okay? But to answer this question honestly. Who would you rather have in control of your life? Two choices here, okay? The all-loving, all-caring, all-powerful God who knows the future, or you. Those are the two choices. The truth is that for many people who name the name of Christ, who call themselves Christians, if they be honest about it, they would prefer that they themselves would have control of their own lives rather than having God in control of their lives, if they answered honestly. We just don't trust God with our lives. Now, we trust him with our eternity of where we're going to spend forever, but for some reason, we struggle more in trusting him today and tomorrow and what we have to face this coming week. We live in a day of surgeries. We live in a day of job layoffs. We live in a day of unexpected illnesses. But as Paul here was confronted with the fear of frailty, a loss of control, he could say with David in Psalm 56.3, when I am afraid, I will put my trust in God. Now, can you say that? For you in your life, is it truly Fear not. But there's a second potential fear that the Apostle Paul could have experienced here. And that is that he was also confronted not only with the fear of frailty, but with the fear of failure. The fear of failure. There was a professional football coach who was hired to coach a losing team. How exciting is that? And you know how it is in professional sports. If your team doesn't win, you get fired. Upon being hired, this new coach for this lousy team was handed two sealed envelopes. He was told to open the first envelope if the season was going rough. And it was. And so he did. He opened up the first envelope, and there was a note there from the former coach. It was a word of encouragement, telling him to blame everything on the former coach, which, by the way, he gladly did. The second sealed envelope said, open this up if the season continues to get bad, and it did. So he opened up the second envelope, and it simply said, prepare two envelopes. So he knew 
that life was getting pretty rough for him. Do you fear failure? Perhaps at one time you thought about starting a business, but you decided then against it because you were concerned that it wouldn't go well. Perhaps you just started a diff difficult class or a new job, or now you have a new responsibility. Perhaps you fear that you will not succeed or you won't be able to hold up. We often forget that Babe Ruth, who had 714 home runs, also struck out 1,330 times. We forget that Thomas Edison had many failed attempts before inventing the light bulb. We forget that R.H. Macy failed seven times before his store in New York finally caught on. Perhaps you fear committing some sin that will shame your testimony or your family. Perhaps you fear of falling out of God's grace and favor. Well, Paul did not fear that. Notice in verse 20 it says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. There was a rookie pitcher. He had just walked his third straight pitcher and the manager went to the mound and says, hey, I think it's time to replace you today. And the pitcher said, oh, no, please don't. Don't replace me. The last time this guy was up, I struck him out. And the manager said, yeah, you're right, but we're in the same inning. And sometimes you can become sort of cocky sure of yourself. And when Paul says here that I will in no way be ashamed, he wasn't sure of himself, but he was sure of his Savior here. A passage I want us to look at in Psalm 37. It says up on the wall here, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. And then verse 24, Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his Hand. It's God that saves us. It is God that keeps us saved. It is God that convicts us and corrects us and cleanses us when we do stumble. And the question I have is, do you fear failure? If you stay in fellowship with God, you will be successful in God's eyes. But the question is, is that what really matters to you? The crucial question is, whose favor are you seeking? The God with whom you will be giving an account to one day? Or your neighbor that you don't even like? Which person are you wanting to say that you're a success? For Paul, he was confronted not only with the fear of frailty, but also the fear of failure. And he could say with David in Psalm 56.3, when I'm afraid, I'll put my trust in God. But there was also another reason where Paul could be a candidate for fear. Not only frailty, not only failure, but also the fear of finality. Do you fear dying? Do you fear death? Tony was in the hospital. He wasn't able to speak. The pastor was called in by the family to be with Tony. And as the pastor stood next to Tony, Tony's condition grew worse. Tony motioned frantically to, to find a pen and paper to write on. The pastor handed him pen and paper. And with all the energy that Tony had, he scribbled something down on a paper and just as he completed it, he handed it to the pastor, and Tony died. The pastor didn't think probably that was the occasion to read what was on the paper, so he just simply put it in his suit coat pocket. He forgot about it until it was time 
for the eulogy. And as he was getting sort of done with the funeral, he realized that he was still wearing the same suit jacket that that note was in. And he said, folks, I just remembered that Tony handed to me a note just before he died. Haven't looked at it yet, but uh, I'm sure it had a wonderful message. Took out the note, looked at it, and it said, Pastor, get off my oxygen hose. <laughs> perhaps you didn't fear death until now. And perhaps you'll think twice before asking the pastor to come visit you in the hospital. <laughs> but what we find is that Paul was not fearful of death because he saw it as the Bible presents it. He saw it as a promotion. He saw it as absent from the body and present with the Lord. Or as Philippians uh, chapter 1 and verse 21 says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul looked forward to the rest and the rewards of heaven and he did not fear what would happen. Let me ask you this. Do you fear that moment when you will stand before Jesus to give an account of your life, of how you've lived it since you've received him as Savior? If you fear that, it must be that there is something between you and God that needs to be corrected and changed or something that needs to be done differently. Or do you look forward to that day and look forward to hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant? We don't need to fear death if we have received Jesus as Savior and we're living our lives for him. And Paul, even though he was confronted with the possibility of fear of frailty, failure, and finality, he could say with David in Psalm 56.3, when I'm afraid... I'll put my trust in God. So I ask you, what's your greatest fear? Paul was in a Roman prison. He feared the three things that people fear most. Frailty, the loss of control. Failure, the loss of achievement. Finality, the loss of life. How are you responding? Do you believe that God ruled this universe before you were born? I bet you do. Are you convinced that God will continue to rule the universe after you're gone? I bet you do. Then why can't you trust him today and this coming week? To transfer from fear to faith. So as one show used to say years ago, so fear will not be a factor for you. When I was growing up, I loved watching superhero cartoons. Maybe you did as well. Batman was my favorite, but Superman was a close second. But one of my top superheroes was not a person at all. It was a dog. Underdog. How many have ever watched the Underdog episodes? Oh, many of you, many of you. You know all about it. Shoe Shine Boy, right? Shoe Shine Boy. What would happen? He would take a super energy pill that he would take out of a secret compartment in his ring. And after taking that pill, he would go into a phone uh, booth and then the phone booth would usually break and he would become underdog and it was amazing. Do you realize that would not fly today? A superhero popping pills. And just think, most kids have never even seen a phone booth, right? It just, it just wouldn't fly. But what would he do? He would rescue sweet Polly Purebred. And it was always the same gangsters, Simon Barr, Sinister, and Riff Raff, remember them? And I liked him because he liked to rhyme. And he never, as shoeshine boy, he never did anything, but he would always say things in rhymes when he was underdog. But the greatest thing that he would say 
after he would bump his head a few times, he was a little bit klutzy, he would say, you remember? There's no need to fear. Underdog is here. And what I want us to realize is there's no need to fear. Your living Savior is here. And there are so many things here and now. This world's getting a little bit creepy, isn't it? And there, if, if anybody could ever be a candidate for fear, it would be in, the, in 2022. But when we have the Holy Spirit living within us, we have Jesus alive and well. No matter what we may face, we've got God with us. And there is no reason to fear. No reason to fear what's ahead this week, this month, this next year. No reason to fear what's going to happen for eternity. And maybe your life lately has been just filled with anxiety, fret, and fear. And the happiness and the sleep that have been sacrificed on the altar of worry hasn't done you a bit of good, has it? Today is to remind you that Jesus is alive and well. And the things that are happening in this world were predicted that was going to take place before the return of the Lord. It's not catching God by surprise. He's just as much in control as he ever was. And he'll continue to be. There's no need to fear. Our living Savior is here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for God's word. I thank you that you're alive and well. I thank you that even as Paul was a candidate for fear, and so were we, that he could say, fear not. And he had his trust in you. May we do the same, no matter what we're facing this week. No matter what obstacles seem to be in, in our way. We thank you that you also see the future and you know what's best. And we, The best we know how, we need to realize that the person that needs to be in full control of our lives is not us but you. Because you love us more than we could even love ourselves. And you see the future in the big picture. So may we trust you. And fear not. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In a moment, we're going to sing Chris Tomlin's song, Jesus Loves Me. The song speaks concerning what Jesus has done for us in forgiving our sins. But that same Savior who provided for us as far as salvation provides for us in anything we're going to face this week. As always, invitation is open. Let's stand as we sing, please. Let's go. 
just like you have a choice of what you will do with Jesus as far as salvation, you have a choice this week of whether you will face what's happening this coming week with fear or with faith. And with the Savior who's alive and well, the Holy Spirit who lives within you, we have no reason to fear. There is no need to fear. Our living Savior is here. So glad you're here this morning. And if, uh, if I have not had an opportunity to say hello to you, I would love to do so. And I'll be in the foyer after the service this morning. Reminder tonight, 6 o'clock, we conclude the New Testament book of Titus. Hope you can join us for that as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for God's word. May we apply it to our hearts and our lives. And this week, may we live a life of faith rather than of fear, trusting our Savior who's alive and well. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Cafe is open 12, till 12.15 and you're dismissed.